Let's process what this week has been like, a painful week, I think, for many Americans. The decision to call Trump's tweets racist, the New York Times, other news outlets had to make these choices. How did you view, view these choices? How, how were they made? I think media is going through an uh, unprecedented time where the president, uh, his president's words are so kind of vocally uh, stoking that kind of white identity and white grievance politics. It's forcing new choices on choices on media outlets. I think newspapers want to show, our instinct is to show and not tell, right? The mm. instinct is to bring out a kind of evidence-based uh, showing of the president's history with race, putting it in context, as you talked about. But there is still a kind of uncomfort with using those labels that some folks think will turn other people off. I mean, I think, as someone who covers race and politics often, that the most important question that sometimes media loses sight of yeah. is just the question of truth. I mean, there is, there, is a, there is a point that some make about whether it turns off readers or what's going to be the reaction. I think the question we should be asking, which is back to our kind of journalistic fundamentals, is was it racist? Was it not racist? And those are the lens in which media has to come to grips with, becoming comfortable with using those type of phrases when they are warranted. And there are multiple words to use depending on what's going on. Bigoted and xenophobic. Exactly. We should get specific and explain why we're getting specific. Tara, what's your view of this? Because one of the standards editors at NPR uh, said this week, we should not be in the business of moral labeling. That's the view from NPR, but a lot of news outlets have been saying the president's attack was racist. Where do you come down? With respect to, I'm, so I'm on the other side, I'm on the PR side of this, and I can tell you, with respect to, to uh, this issue, this ongoing issue that we seem to be grappling with, is journalism to me, and what it has been historically in historic context, is it's always been about exposing wrong, wrongdoing, exposing the corruption of both government as well as corporations. Anyone can be a stenographer. The job of a journalist is not to be a stenographer. And the Trump administration has actually leveraged the fact that journalism is often looking to just put out there what he said. Just quote and him. So, uh, just quote him. And so he uses that to his advantage to mm. mislead the public. So, so anyone can be a stenographer. The role of the jur of journalists should be watchdogs, should be about exposing things. Historically, Pentagon Papers in 1971, journalism at its best. 1972, the Watergate break-in, journalism at its best. 1992, mm. exposing sexual misconduct in Congress. That is what our uh, journalism industry has done at its best. And that is the legacy and the history of journalism in this country. So I don't see why we would deviate from that now. Right. Not, don't just quote it. Put it in context. And that applies to the rallies as well. Dan, the, the Wednesday night rally where we, we see the audience chanting, send her back. Trump did one of those things where he said, don't believe your own eyes. Don't believe your own ears. He said that he interrupted right away and moved on. Well, not the interrupted. He said he, he moved on right away. Obviously, 13 seconds was an eternity uh, at that rally. Why do you think he gets away with telling his fans, don't believe what you saw on that videotape, just believe what I'm saying now? Don't well, believe your lying eyes. Partly because he's a great showman. Let's face it, he's very good on television. He's a powerful figure on television. But the other thing I think we have to keep in mind, and this goes back to a bit of the previous conversation, look, racism is as racism does. Mm -hmm. And this argument among journalists about whether we should say that racism is racism, I'm, I'm sorry, doesn't get very far. <laughs> when it's racism, it needs to be called racism. Hmm. But I do point out that the president, it isn't enough just to call out his racist language. When he does things like he lies repeatedly about the four uh, young women congressmen, he's lied repeatedly. He's taken their words out of context, which is pretty much a lie in and of itself. Now, the journalist's job, whether it's a rally or the president's tweet, or the president standing shouting on the back lawn of the White House is to put that in context. There's the dangerous trap of forgetting. Journalists tend to forget the long line of things that you outlined to start the program. It's very important to put these things into context. And frankly, what we journalists sh should be doing is every time the president tells a, a lie, for example, about these four congressmen, right away it needs to be pointed out that this is a lie. And to call it what it is, not just say, well, the president has said something here that's a little controversial. Yeah, I hate the word controversial these days. I see it in banners and headlines all the time. Controversial can be a really good thing. In yeah. this case, it's a gross, sickening thing. But you know, Brian, Americans pride themselves. We like straight talk. <laughs> we like somebody who looks you in the eye, has a firm handshake, and tells you what they think. Hmm. Don't try to cut it. 
So when it's racist, say that it's racist. When it's out of context, say that it's out of context. Repeat what he said and then go through the record. Because there's, there is this what I call dangerous trap of forgetting the long record. And that applies not only to what he's done in race, but what he's done to undermine the institutions of the country, the hmm. on checks and balances, what he said during the campaign that he hasn't done, this doesn't get nearly as, uh, enough attention, in my opinion, that he promised he's going to take care of health care. He hasn't. He said he was going to start a big infrastructure. He hasn't. Uh, he said he was going to raise the minimum wage. He hasn't. So hold him to account, not just for the things that he says, including the racist things he says, but to what he said during the campaign. Mm. That's been pretty much forgotten, and I do think it needs to be brought to the forefront by reporters. Mm. Let's also briefly touch on where the president is getting these ideas from, why he's attacking these four progressive congresswomen. Uh, he's hearing a lot about them on Fox News. Look at the graphic that we produced here showing mentions of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez on Fox, CNN, and MSNBC, uh, basically from January up until this weekend. You can see that she's talked about on Fox a lot more than on CNN or MSNBC. And that is true as well for Ilhan Omar. So we decided to compare Ilhan Omar and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez uh, to a couple of the leading House Democrats, Democrats who actually have a lot of power. Uh, we chose Jim Clyburn, for example, one of the leaders of Nancy Pelosi's uh, House. And we can put you on screen the mentions of Clyburn compared to AOC and Omar, and you see he's barely in the news uh, compared to these freshman congresswomen. Tara, is, is, is that a, a legitimate complaint that the press is focusing so much on the freshmen and not on the actual leaders of the House? That is, of course, a legitimate complaint. This is about racial opportunism. And Trump is taking advantage of, of race divisions in this country, existing, long existing fissures in this country, because he's been rewarded for doing so by his base. And so he's responding to that. And one of the things I want to point out, too, as someone who is in marketing and PR, is that that so-called so extemporaneous chant of send her back by the audience seems pretty suspicious because typically that type of thing is organized. When you see chants in audiences, a lot of times it's either someone is stoking it from the, you know, backstage or offstage or there are people in the audience who have been sort of planted to do those things. So I think that people should actually look into that as well, because this all seems, I think Trump is far more calculating hmm. than people make him out to be. This is all a strategy. He won. And the answer to that is, let's hear from voters more. If, if that's possible, let's hear from the voters in the crowd more. Right. Let's find out what they were thinking. I would like to spend 10 times as much time hearing from voters as, as where we are now. And instead, wrapping up here, the question I started with, is the press up to the challenge? What do you recommend to newsrooms that are grappling with how to cover openly racist behavior from a U.S. president? I think in the same way we think about other issues that are core to kind of politics right now, in the same way that we uh, think about uh, health care and, and other kind of quote unquote kitchen table issues, newsrooms need to recognize that race and identity will be the central key point of this election and that we and we as media need to empower and reporters to think about those issues in the same kind of fact driven, clear mm -hmm eyed accountability driven way that we think about other issues and so that requires talking to voters that requires talking to white voters and saying at, at those Trump rallies and saying what do they think about this when I talk to folks about white identity and what they're feeling right now they will openly tell you uh, kind of that they are worried about a, a, a replacement in this country they're worried about the influx of minorities and, and, and immigrants and that is things that we cannot shy away from because that is not the side on that is not the side course of this election, it is the, the, the main entree. It is. It's the main story. The fading away of white dominance is a massive story. Yeah. But sometimes the biggest stories are the hardest ones for us to tell, right? We're more comfortable covering a tweet than we are covering something that's affecting generations. Yeah, and, and to point back, we have a long history of being kind of bad at this stuff, if we want to be kind of honest. I mean, when we think about the Civil Rights Movement, when we think about the Great Migration, when we think about newsrooms have historically struggled rising to the challenge of covering race in this country. This requires newsrooms thinking about the issue in a different way, yeah. and, and that's going to be what we're going to have to do going forward. This is an opportunity for all of us.